Whether trickling or churning, streams often inspire us. But most of us do not think of the relationship between surface water flow in streams and groundwater. In fact, in some places surface water seeps into the ground, while in other areas groundwater discharges to the surface. This relationship varies depending on climatic and geologic conditions. Most of us are familiar with the hydrologic cycle in which water evaporates on warmer, sunnier days, forms clouds, moves across the landscape and precipitates, moistening the soil and running over the land to streams. However, the water that infiltrates below the root zone of plants is often overlooked because it is not visible from the surface. Yet this groundwater can impact surface water. In a global sense, water can be transferred or transformed, but the total amount of water remains the same. Depending on the track you chose to view, you saw the impacts of using the same volume of groundwater in one of two different basins. Either a humid basin with a precipitation of 50 inches per year and evapotranspiration of 70%, or a semi-arid environment receiving 20 inches of precipitation per year with evapotranspiration of 90%. Both are comprised of silt and sand and have the same capacity for groundwater storage with a 25% yield when water levels decline. However, materials in the semi-arid basin do not transmit water as readily so as to simulate the same water levels in both basins. Hydrologists will think of this in terms of hydraulic conductivities ranging from 10 to 450 feet per day. We evaluated many scenarios with pumping small and large amounts from shallow and deep zones and in some cases returning a portion of the water to the aquifer. Depending on the situation, stream flow increased or decreased. A single home has no measurable impact. The greatest impact on the stream flow occurs for cases where more water is withdrawn from the shallow aquifer with less return. The addition of irrigated agriculture with water withdrawn from the local aquifer has a substantial impact on stream flow. When the same amount of water is used in both basins, impact is larger on the semi-arid basin because less water is available. For example, with a combination of irrigated agriculture and 700 people per square mile, the percent of stream depletion and the magnitude of cyclic variation is larger in the semi-arid environment, even though it takes longer for the full stream depletion to occur. The basins evaluated here are only two possible situations. All basins are unique. Some have substantial infiltration combined with aquifers that store and transmit significant amounts of water. Some have a deep aquifer that may be a good source of supply, while others do not. Although stream basins can have very different properties and environments, consider a hypothetical basin where, when we cut into the earth, there are layers of sand, silt, and gravel. We use a plexiglass tank to represent this system. Tubes in the sand tank represent wells. A depression in the surface represents a stream where a valve on the back of the tank allows water to flow away. A sandy zone forms a shallow aquifer. It is unconfined because water levels in wells of this aquifer occur within the aquifer. A deep gravel aquifer is separated from the shallow aquifer by a fairly continuous layer of silt. The water levels in the wells that tap this zone are above its top, so we call this a confined aquifer. Water does not pass easily through the silt layer. This is called an aquitard. We cannot see where the water is flowing because it is clear, so we add green dye along the left edge. In time-lapse photos, the dye reveals the groundwater in the deep aquifer seeps upward through a thin zone in the silt and discharges to the surface of the stream. Water in the shallow aquifer also discharges to the stream. This is a gaining stream because groundwater flows to the surface at the stream. If we were strolling along in the downstream direction, flow in the stream would be larger as we walked further. When we stop adding dye, the dye is flushed from the system as groundwater continues to discharge to the stream. In the sand tank, water can only exit the stream. Natural systems have many different configurations and properties. Some deep aquifers may be of regional extent, such that the deep groundwater flows onward for a great distance with only a small amount of leakage up to the stream. If we add red dye to the surface water and pump groundwater from the well in the shallow aquifer near the center of the tank, 
water moves from both the reservoir and the stream to the well. This is a losing stream because water flows from the stream into the ground. If we walked in the downstream direction here, flow in the stream would decrease as we walked further. When we stop pumping the well, the flow pattern returns to the pre-pumping condition and groundwater discharges to the surface of the stream. If instead we add red dye to the surface water and pump groundwater from a well in the deep aquifer, there is less loss of water from the stream. Again, when we stop pumping, the system returns to the original flow pattern with groundwater exiting to the surface at the stream. It is important to know that the changes occur rapidly in the sand tank, but may take months, years, decades, or centuries to occur in the field. Groundwater and surface water interactions like these can be simulated with computer models. Next, we use computer simulations to illustrate flow of groundwater to and from the surface at a stream in situations that are too complex to illustrate with the sand tank. Consider a small basin approximately 10 miles wide and 20 miles long. Basins have different properties and environments. Here we consider a semi-arid environment Precipitation is 20 inches per year, with 1 inch running over the land to the stream and 1 inch infiltrating to the groundwater system, while the remainder, 90%, evaporates or transpires from plants. The alternative track of this video presents the same scenarios for a humid case in which precipitation is 50 inches per year, with 7.5 inches running over land to the stream and 7.5 inches infiltrating to the groundwater system while the remainder, 70%, evaporates or transpires from plants. Like the sand tank, this basin has a shallow and deep aquifer. This basin differs from the sand tank in that the deep aquifer extends a great distance in both directions and flow in the deep aquifer is to the left. In this case, the deep and shallow aquifers have properties similar to the shallow aquifer in the sand tank while the aquitard does not allow water to pass as readily as the aquitard in the sand tank. Flow in the deep aquifer is controlled by distant conditions, but a small amount of water leaks between the upper and lower aquifers. Both magnitude and direction of leakage change when the aquifers are pumped. This oblong shape is a simplified representation of a surface water basin, which is defined by the high ground surrounding a stream we map groundwater by drawing lines connecting points of equal water levels in wells. Lines with hot colors represent higher water levels in the upper and lateral limits of the basin. Cooler colors represent lower water levels near the stream and mouth of the basin. Water flows through the ground from areas of higher to lower water levels. We evaluate a number of different scenarios. First, we consider the impact of only one home pumping near the stream from the shallow aquifer. Then we evaluate pumping from the shallow aquifer at many homes throughout the stream basin in a rural setting with 100 people per square mile. The average population density in the United States in the year 2000 was 79 people per square mile. This is similar to the year 2000 population density of Tucson, Arizona and Sioux City, Iowa. Finally, we consider a setting with 700 people per square mile, which is similar to the population density of the Buffalo, New York, and El Paso, Texas areas in the year 2000. For comparison, the population density of Jersey City, New Jersey was 13,000 people per square mile, and the Orange County, Los Angeles area was 3,000 people per square mile. We consider five scenarios for the higher population density. First, the water is withdrawn from the shallow aquifer by a cluster of wells near the stream and distributed to users who return wastewater to the shallow aquifer at the point of use. In the second scenario, the wastewater is not returned to the aquifer, but is collected, treated, and discharged to the stream at the mouth of the basin. Third, the wells pump from the deep aquifer while wastewater is returned to the shallow aquifer at the point of use. Fourth, we consider the case where the deep aquifer is pumped and wastewater is not returned to the aquifer. In the final scenario, we add irrigated agriculture and seasonal variability with more water use during the irrigation season. If only one domestic well is pumped near the stream, 
impact is minimal. If the domestic well is for a typical household, about 300 gallons per day would be pumped. Rural homes with wells have on-site wastewater disposal systems that return water to the aquifer. The amount returned varies depending on the construction of the system and the character of the soil and geology. We will assume 85% of the water returns, so for this scenario, 45 gallons of water are consumed from the aquifer each day. Of course, the pump turns on and off throughout the day, but we consider the average long-term influence of the pumping at the gauge in the middle of the basin. Before pumping, 16 cubic feet of water flowed past the stream gauge each second. With the addition of one home, changes in the system are too small to measure. Now consider a rural setting with homes spread throughout the basin at a low density of, for example, 100 people per square mile. In this case, they do not irrigate, but only use water for domestic purposes, and some of the water returns to the aquifer through wastewater disposal systems. Again, for this simulation, we assume that 85% of the water returns. In that case, the net volume of water pumped throughout the basin is only one one-hundredth of the water that leaves the basin as stream flow. There is little impact to the system. For this situation, the stream flow past the stream gauge decreases slightly to 99% of the flow before development. If the area is more populated, averaging 700 people per square mile, a municipal water distribution system may be developed in which a cluster of wells is pumped to serve the entire basin. First, we consider a cluster of wells pumping the shallow aquifer near the stream with the wastewater disposed at each home. Ultimately, the rate of water flowing past the stream gauge is reduced to 93% of the flow before development. If the wastewater is not disposed at each home, but is instead piped to a treatment facility and discharged near the mouth of the stream, the impact is more substantial. Ultimately, the stream flow at the gauge is reduced to 59% of the flow before development. Although the depletion impacts users in this basin, flow below the treatment plant is not impacted as much due to the discharge from the treatment plant to the stream. Flow below the plant is 93% of the pre-development flow. This scenario also illustrates the extreme case in which none of the pumped water is returned to the aquifer. In that case, the depletion of stream flow at the gauge would be 59% and the flow would not be replenished at the mouth of the basin. The reductions of stream flow that we have been talking about thus far may not occur for a long time. The time required depends on the nature of the aquifer materials and the distance of the wells from the stream. While the system is changing, water is coming from storage in the aquifer. Once the reduction of flow to the stream equals the water flow from the wells, we have come to a new equilibrium. If we monitor water level from the start of pumping, we find the lines that represent water levels around the cluster of wells shift back from the cluster. This represents declining water levels in the subsurface as water flows to the wells. As the water levels decline, the amount of water flowing by the gauge in the stream is also decreasing with time. Let's cut into the earth and look at a section of the subsurface. We use hot colors to show where water levels in wells are higher and cool colors for lower levels. We can see the flow of groundwater up from the deep aquifer on the right toward the stream in the shallow aquifer and downward to the deep aquifer on the left. When pumping begins, a cone of depressed water levels form around the cluster of wells. The wells are only open to the aquifer near its base, so water flows down through the ground to that level when pumped. Arrows represent the volume of water flowing through the ground. Much more water is flowing in the deep aquifer. Before pumping, water in the shallow aquifer flows to the center, then up and out to the stream. When pumping begins, the arrows turn toward the wells and grow larger, while flow toward the stream reverses direction and flows toward the wells. If the water is pumped from the deep aquifer and wastewater is returned to the shallow aquifer at each home, stream flow will increase because regional aquifer water will be returned to the local aquifer and some will discharge to the stream in this case, for the aquifer properties and conditions in this basin, the stream flow increases to 133% of what it was before development, reaching full impact after 113 years. 
The water consumed in this case impacts outflow at some distant location. The full impact may occur quickly, or it may take months, years, or decades. In the humid environment simulated in the parallel track of this video, the impact is smaller. If the water is pumped from the deep aquifer, and the wastewater is collected, treated, and returned to the river near the mouth of the basin, the stream flow is barely affected. Flow decreases to only 99% of what it was before development, and the full impact occurs after 125 years. In the humid environment, simulated in the parallel track of this video, the impact is slightly smaller. The rate of precipitation and pumping varies throughout the year. As a result, the water levels and amount of flow in the stream vary with time. In areas with substantial volumes of irrigation, there is additional pumping in the summer. In this example, the population density is again 700 people per square mile, but many of them live near the well cluster. In addition to the municipal pumping, 10% of the land is irrigated during May through September with an application of 20 inches over the entire growing season. For this simulation, we assume that 50% of that water is transpired by the crop and 50% infiltrates back into the aquifer. Given the varying precipitation and pumping, groundwater levels decline in the irrigation season and rise afterward in a cyclic pattern. Impact on the stream is also cyclic, but on average decreases gradually for about 76 years before reaching a cyclic equilibrium. Eventually, the average flow in the stream is 45% of the flow before development. In the humid environment, simulated in the parallel track of this video, the impact is much smaller. Clearly, there is a point at which water usage could exceed the amount of water available, as has been the case for many streams, for example, in western Kansas during recent years. So we need to plan appropriately. To determine the potential for groundwater resources in a specific basin, we need to drill wells to investigate the subsurface, estimate the rate of infiltration, and calculate a water budget. When this information is available, we can estimate the magnitude of population and types of land use that may be supported in the basin. Approaches to managing water include promoting conservation and changing land use, water price structure, the timing of water withdrawal and use, or treatment and reuse practices. The appropriate solution differs depending on social, economic, and hydrogeologic conditions. As an example, for the final scenario in the semi-arid environment, there is an excess of stream flow during some times of year and a scarcity at others. For this case, one possible water resource management solution involves continued municipal pumping from the cluster with 85% return flow at the homes during November through April when there is no irrigation pumping. At the same time, additional wells near the stream are pumped to induce stream water to flow through the aquifer. That water can then be delivered to a recharge basin to store water in the aquifer in a zone that is surrounded by barrier walls. When the irrigation season begins, the wells near the stream are turned off and the pumping of the municipal wells is reduced. The municipal water needs are met by pumping the water that was stored in the aquifer. The same volume of water is supplied to the municipality each day. In this example, the new management plan is implemented in November after five years of mixed municipal and agricultural pumping. These red dots represent stream flow without the aquifer storage. They are overlain by blue dots representing the flow after implementation of the aquifer storage plan. Notice the new management practice ameliorates the impact of the seasonal irrigation pumping on stream flow. A plan could be devised to store more water and further moderate variation of the stream flow. This is just one combination of geologic, climatic, and management conditions. Other areas will experience more or less impact depending on their specific conditions. This video has demonstrated the interaction between surface water and groundwater, balanced consideration of conditions in a basin and land use, coupled with conservation and adjustment of management practices can lead to sustainable communities. If you have questions about what you have seen in this video, please contact the developers of the interactive roles of surface and groundwater at www.ngwa.org. This video was developed through a cooperative effort between the National Groundwater Association in Westerville, Ohio, 
and the International Groundwater Modeling Center of Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado.